Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Thank you again for joining on us, joining us on this beautiful Shabbat. Uh, today is the 20th of May, 2023, or 5783 on the Hebrew calendar. And today's parasha is called Bad Midbar, which is in the wilderness, uh, which is what <laughs> the actual book of numbers is called in Hebrew. And so we're the Torah portion for this uh, today is coming from Numbers chapter 1, verse 1, to chapter 4, verse 20. And for the Haftarah, the prophetic portion, we're reading in Hosea chapter 1, verse 10, to chapter 2, verse 20, or uh, <clears throat> chapter 2, verse 1, to chapter 22 in the Hebrew Bible. And for the Becharashah, we are reading in... Uh, Matthew chapter 24, verses 29 through 20, uh, 36. Um, Luke chapter 16, verse 1 through chapter 17, verse 10. Romans chapter 15, verses 1 through 7. And 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 20. And my name is Rabbi Clint Harebrai. And before we start today, I'd like to open this time in prayer. So, Abba Father, thank you for this opportunity to be with you, to study again from your word. And to learn from you, may your word just come out of my mouth and that your Holy Spirit guide everything that comes out of my mouth in the name of Yeshua for your glory. Amen. <clears throat> so today's uh, topic, the first topic is journey through the wilderness. <clears throat> Here we're talking about life. Life, as we know, is a test, right? It's more like a long journey through the wilderness, if you ask me. <laughs> At least my times of the wilderness have been a lot more than the times of refreshing, I'd have to say. Uh, but, and there's always lots of tests along the way. However, in the book of Numbers tells the story of the Israelites' journey from the Mount Sinai to the land of Canaan. And along the way, the children of Israel face tests and challenges as they go toward their ultimate destination, right? Lots of griping, lots of complaining, lots of cursing, lots of uh, everything. And uh, the declaration of death above those on those above the year, uh, age of 20, <clears throat> including Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. So the land of the promise is their ultimate destination. And they bet, as we know, they met failures and triumphs and learned important, timeless lessons. Like, hey, don't complain. And <clears throat> don't want to go back to your old junk. So the journey from Egypt to the promised land is a great metaphor for the spiritual journey through life that we make. Just as Israel's journey began when Hashem liberated them from Egypt, our spiritual path begins with the great salvation <clears throat> when we meet the Messiah, Yeshua. So just as Hashem brought Israel to Mount Sinai, the Messiah brings us to the revelation of the Torah. Uh, just as Israel's goal was a promised land, our ultimate destination is eternal life in the world to come and the new Jerusalem. So between here and there, we're going to face a lot of trials, right? Tests and all kinds of adventures. Some fun, not so great. Some not so great. So like the children of Israel, we may face uh, <clears throat> warfare. A lot of warfare is going to come along our way. You know, it's spiritual, but it can, you know, affect the physical. You can face temptations, discontentment. You know, there's with complaining, agonizing hardships, losing people, losing loved ones, losing things, uh, redirection. It, it's all there. But as with the Israelites in the wilderness, our success or failure is determined by our reactions to these trials. <clears throat> Are we going to complain, become bitter, and complain to God? To Hashem, we're going to say, hey, thank you for what you're giving me. Thank you for this manna. Thank you for this quail. Thank you for the lack of water. Thank you for whatever. So Paul uses a, a very similar metaphor. He compared the life of faith to a race run by athletes. Think about it. <clears throat> a long-term race like a marathon. You're probably tempted to quit, complain. Uh, all kinds of things, right? I never ran one, don't want to. So the competitors in the race keep their eyes on the prize ahead. You know, Paul was the mighty apostle, right? The guy went through everything and he was confident in his salvation. 
that he did not regard himself as if he had already arrived at his goal. <clears throat> he says, brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. I press on toward the goal for the prize <clears throat> of the upward call of God in the Messiah, Yeshua. This is found in Philippians 3, 13 and 14. So in his metaphor of the race, Paul declares, I do all things for the sake of the gospel so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. 1 Corinthians 9.23 He was concerned that, after having preached to others, he would find himself disqualified from the race in 1 Corinthians 9.27. So if these are Paul's sentiments, how much more so should we be concerned about the prize with the prize that lies ahead? There's so much just, I don't know, laziness and lack of concern in the so-called world of the body of Yeshua these days. It's like, do you even care about anything? And the book of Numbers illustrates the hazards in this race. The generation of Israelites who left Mount Sinai never did reach the promised land. Even Hashem said, you will never enter my rest. Guess what that means? They're going to go right to Sheol. To hell. Yeah. When we rent, enter God's rest, is shalom. It means we're with him for eternity. At least that's what I gather from what is said. So the journey through life's spiritual wilderness is filled with difficulties and dangers. Paul said, if anyone competes as an athlete, he's not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. In 2 Timothy 2.5. So we need to be mindful of the Bible's rules for this journey while we're here on this earth. <clears throat> Each day we need to recommit ourselves to pressing forward and keeping our eyes on the goal that is ahead of us. This doesn't mean that if the laborer's failure has sent them, sends them to damnation. I'm not saying that. But there is a prize to be won. He never sent Israel back to Egypt, right? He just killed them all. At least those are 20 and above. Maybe they are in his rest now, in his eternal rest. That's what I hope. But it does mean that there are consequences for how we conduct ourselves. And there is rich reward for those who stay the course. And if you remember, Yeshua also does give the story about the seed that falls on the side of the road. There's good seed that, that comes up and... and, and and that produces 100 times more than what was planted. And then there's seed that falls in the in the bushes and grows up and it gets choked out by the problems of the world. Hey, that means, you know, it's serious. And then there's a seed that just dies away immediately. So, because the ground is shallow and hard. And the second one I want to talk about is the house of the father. <clears throat> if Gentile believers are grafted into Israel, and that's what the Bible says, with which of the 12 tribes of Israel... So do Gentile believer identify. This is just kind of a fun little thing to talk about. The census in the wilderness kind of shows the family structure and relationship of the nation of Israel. All the children of Israel were one large family, right? Mm -hmm. The hierarchical family relationships reveal the Bible's patriarchal worldview. The breakdown of the nation into tribe, clan, and household demonstrates a, a strong central position of the fathers. The entire nation looked back to one common father, right? They were descendants of Jacob. Before that, Isaac. Before that, Abraham. That's why they were called children of Israel, though. Jacob became Israel, right? So each Israelite could trace maybe his line of descent through one of the 12 sons of Jacob. Because Jacob had the 12 sons. So that's where you get the 12 tribes. <clears throat> but all 12 tribes came from Jacob. That line of descent formed his or her tribal identity. Those who were descended from a common father were referred to as a tribe. The 12 sons of Jacob were fathers over the tribes. The tribes of Israel were further broken down into large extended families. So the Hebrew word for family is mishpacha. Or mishpa yeah, mishpacha. And however, when used in the tribal sense, it does and not refer to a nuclear family household. <clears throat> it refers to the large extended family. I can call you my mishpacha. You are my mishpacha. Those who believe in Yeshua, you're all, we're all mishpacha. 
So it refers to the large extended family of a common forefather within a tribe. A better English word is clan. Clan is like a sub-tribe, a tribe within a tribe. So every clan was composed, made up of many households. The Hebrew word for household is Beit Av, which is a term that literally translates as house of a father. The father's household was made up of himself, a wife, or wives, because back then they could have more wives, children, and grandchildren. <clears throat> the children and grandchildren belong to that father. So the common denominator in all these family rankings is basically the central position of the father. And it's really weird because I want to take a sidestep here. Now, <laughs> one's Jewishness, if you want, you want to call it that, is based off of a mother. Is your mother a Jew? They don't count the father, which is the opposite of what it was back then. I find that very weird and interesting, but that's how it is. In the biblical world, fatherhood was the essential ingredient for family and identity. Kind of chauvinistic, you might say, right? Everybody would say, oh, that's so chauvinistic or so sexist or whatever. But not from the perspective of the biblical woman. She regarded her father and husband as her prestige and her identity. They were the affirmation of her femininity. They provided her protection, sustenance, and dignity. So it's a different way of thinking from what we have today. And I have to say, I don't really agree with many things of how we think of today. So the patriarchal worldview explains why Paul was so eager to establish spiritual opportunity for the Gentile believers. To be reckoned as part of the nation of Israel, the Gentile believers needed to come under the household of Israel's fathers. Grafted in, right? So in Paul's theology, Gentile believers were adopted into the family of Israel, not the other way around. Jew and Gentile alike, we all share in the person of Yeshua, the Messiah, and our fellow heirs, citizens in the Israel of Hashem, the kingdom of the Messiah. There are many people out there who call themselves Jews and are Jewish by blood, Hebrews, Israelites by blood. Hashem will say, hey, sorry. You rejected my son, Yeshua. You are not part of my people. It's sad. Except for those who are left alive at the end of the seven years, <clears throat> when it says all of Israel will be saved. Okay, let's put that aside. So we, may, we have all been brought near by the same atonement and given the same Torah. So still a Gentile believer might wonder, which tribe of Israel is he or she to be identified with? <clears throat> Since the Gentile disciples partition, uh, partition, can't even speak, participation in Israel is only by means of faith in Yeshua, the son of David. David, the Gentiles' tribal family affinity maybe is naturally with David's tribe, which is a tribe of Judah. That's just kind of something to throw out there, something fun. So I hope you've enjoyed today's little teaching, and I hope you have a wonderful Shabbat. Shabbat Shalom to all of you. I want to ask you to do me a favor, please. If you subscribe to our channel and you put like, it helps us be more visible to those out there who need to hear the message of salvation through Yeshua. And that's our only goal, is to reach our fellow Jews <clears throat> with the message of salvation through Yeshua. So if you could just put like, every like helps. Every subscription helps. Even if you never follow us again, but just subscribe. Liking helps. It makes it helps us be more visible to those who need us. That's all we're here for. Everything we do, we do for free. And so I just want you to know that we don't ask. I mean, we do have the occasional offering. And thank you for those who do that. But everything we do, we do for free. <clears throat> we do not uh, sell anything on our website except for tambourines, which we paint and paint. We buy and hand paint ourselves, and there are some prayer pillows. We do sell kippahs and prayer shawls. That's a few things. And uh, the Ribstein also makes handmade uh, head headdresses for women, those who uh, want those. That's all we sell, but those are because we hand make them and we have to buy the materials and that's it. And whatever money we get from those, we pour back into the ministry. Everything else we have on our website, all of our resources, everything we have, it's free.
And a lot of those resources we had to come up with ourselves because there were nothing here in it, in Italy as far as messianic resources in Italian. We would create the messianic sidor for Erev Shabbat, for the Shabbat. We, we, create, we came up with the <clears throat> Saturday morning Shabbat sidor. We made the sidor for the Pesach, the Passover. We made one for a daily sidor, you know, the daily prayers. <clears throat> We, we try to do as best as we can. And all we do is to ask, please, if you could like and subscribe. <laughs> and if you want to help us in any uh, physical way, uh, financially, there is a link below also for that. But we do not ever push for that. Also, check out our links below for our Messianic resources. I know America and other countries that are English speaking have thousands, millions of resources probably, but we want to share what we have for free. And uh, also there is a Machasei Shil Tikpa link, which I say many times, Rebbe Tzin Gabriela is, has a website in English and Italian for those who wish to receive counseling on a biblical basis. She is a licensed counselor. <clears throat> and also there is a link for contacting us and uh, just a general link to our website, I believe, if not, you can always click on one of the links on our website from the contact page or from the Messianic resource page. So check that all out. It's uh, We try to make our website as best as we can. I know it might get a little confusing up at the top where all the menus are. I have no control over that. It's WordPress. What do you want? It's not the greatest, uh, but it's better than some of the other websites we could have found that were where we can make websites ourselves. Uh, uh, so that's what we got. May you have a blessed Shabbat. Shabbat Shalom to all of you. Thank you.